Patrick clicked in to College Volleyball Weekly on Viral Volley Media. Now here's your host, Rob on Mike. All right, good day, College Volleyball Weekly, episode six. That is crazy to think we're already that deep in. Conference play just started, but more importantly, there's some big news this week across the NCAA men's ranks, and the theme is missing miles, question mark. Uh, the 2022 ABCA NBA All-American, Miles Partain, announced his departure from the team. Thoughts on his departure, and uh, who wants to take a stab? Ooh. As a, oh, there you go, Theo from Cal State Northridge. Yeah, you know, this is obviously big news for men's volleyball. Um, you know, Partain is is a fantastic volleyball player and uh, obviously a, a person who could start on probably most rosters throughout the country uh, and definitely UCLA's. So an incredibly uh, shocking I don't know, piece of news, but development. Here's that's what they yeah, say in the newscast. Well, and here's 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 my take on it. And I think that this is uh I think this is the interesting thing, right? We see it all the time when international players come and play here, right? We saw it last year with Long Beach, where they had Nikolov, um, has a fantastic year. And outside of college volleyball, his career starts to develop, right? He goes and he plays for Bulgaria. There's some obvious ability to play professionally, make some really good money and do some things outside of college volleyball, right? There was a lot of the similar chatter with Miles. His success on the beach was really, really impressive. Um, he's a fantastic volleyball player, obviously indoors, but his beach game, it looks like is going to be his future. Um, and I think we're always shocked when we see an American player go down this, this path where they're choosing to prepare themselves for the Olympics, choosing their professional career over indoor men's volleyball. And, you know, I think if you ask me, a lot of this boils back down to the scholarship situation. Um, and again, if a lot of our young men were going to school for free and this was 100% paid for experience, I think there'd be a lot more to decide for Miles. And, you know, without understanding too much of the complexities of the coaching staff and the dynamic that's happening in their camp, it's difficult to really tell you exactly what is the motivation behind all of this. But we all know that full scholarships are incredibly rare and, and not very common. And so when you're looking at what should you do and how should you do it, there's other ways to pay for school. There's other ways of, to spend your time, um, even if your plan is to stick around and get a degree. And I think for Miles, uh, this is probably a tough decision for him, uh, but I think it might be a good one at the end of the day. And that's the uh, that's the tough reality for all of us as coaches when you have a really good player who decides that they want to take another path. Yeah. All right, Jay. I, yeah, I'll, I'll I really echo what Theo said. The the thing that I didn't even take into consideration is the scholarship situation. We don't know what Miles is getting, uh, you know, but but I think. Most coaches would tell you, uh, with the exception maybe of a few here and there, most kids are not on full rides, so you're not you're not you're not getting it all for free, so to speak. Whereas on the women's side, obviously, it's twelve full scholarships and six more for beach. Which don't get me started on that subject. But the the the, the reality is is that in today's day and age, uh, we're going to start seeing probably more often. Uh, a player here and there, a high level player here and there that's going to leave after a year or two. It's it's taken on a little bit of the the basketball, you know, one and done type situation, especially for the high end players. You know, I think the first one of the first ones we heard about was it Clay Stanley. Didn't he leave early? I think one time when he was at Hawaii. I know obviously Matt Anderson left a year early back in 2009. Um, you know, there there's there's been some history, so there's precedent set for it. But it's going to start taking on a little bit more of a, of a common theme in terms of us hearing about it every year. Miles obviously has some people in his ear at the USA Volleyball Office for Beach saying you have a legitimate shot at making the roster for the 24 Olympics. I know he just partnered up with Andy Benish and they're going to take on this 23 season together. I, I, I think if Miles were maybe not so high up in that depth chart, maybe he'd think twice about it. But obviously somebody somewhere feels that the investment made in him with USA Beach and with AVP, 
that he's got a legitimate shot on it. So that's got to help out too. I don't know if he's leaving school. Uh, I, I would find it hard to believe that that would be so much of an impactful time schedule that he wouldn't be able to finish school out. Cause obviously in the summer, that's where most of the tournaments are going on. And now if you want, you don't necessarily have to worry about NCAA and compliance in your office and worrying about what your school you're missing. You can do it all on your own. If you're, if you have to travel throughout the year. So uh, yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal for UCLA, but apparently the guy they have coming up behind him, Rowan, is uh, is legit and can handle it, and it's not that big of an issue. He just beat Long Beach twice. So, you know, it, from UCLA's standpoint, okay, bummed. You lost the MBSF player of the year, but guy behind is not that bad. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's my take on it all. Yep. And then close it out with uh, Brad of UC San Diego. Yeah, for me, it's a little different. I mean, I think it's more from Miles' perspective, like an opportunity to go represent your country in the Olympics is pretty astronomical, you know, and the ability to pursue that. And with Beach so much, it's that partner companionship and teammate ship and being able to invest that extra time through the training, uh, I would imagine weighed really heavily on whoever his partner ended up being. And obviously Andy Banesh ended up being his partner. And I would imagine having those forces and having your partner and having the people around you wanting to see you reach that goal and reach that milestone in your career is um, pretty impactful. Um, and then in terms of like financial or scholarship, like with UCLA, it's one of the more affordable educations, um, you know, within California and within men's volleyball um, outside of the state school. So it's, it's, I don't think that stands out too much to me. But also right now they have Andrew Rowan and who's playing great and is probably one of the best setting recruits I've seen come up through the club rankings with all of his success. So right now I think it's it's kind of a win-win for Miles and for UCLA and for Andrew. Um, but where it gets scary is as fatigue sets in over the course of the year, um, as the freshman body starts to wear down for Andrew Rowan and, um, you know, heaven forbid anything um, unfortunate happens at that setting position, that's where it really hits the fan. Um, and that's where yeah. things get really scary. And that's where it adds to stress is that unknown of what could happen um, over the course of a grueling season. Um, and, you know, obviously UCLA has been battle tested and, and Andrew's been on the court for a lot of those opportunities, um, but just kind of sticking with it and, and seeing it come through. And even Miles missed a ton of the fall with some of his AP travel and FIVB travel. So um, it's surprising. Um, but I think most coaches would agree that if there's any freshman setter you want in your gym um, in this situation to pop up, it'd probably be Andrew Ron. Yeah. Well, you guys each touched on some really great points and even some of the uh, follow-up questions I had, I'm going to go and ask them again, just so we can address it more directly. Um, but so what does this do to the Bruins this year as a team? And will they miss miles? Uh, we already saw three matches where he's got the nod at start, but from a coach's standpoint and what we're seeing him do on the court uh, or Andrew Rowan and the Bruins, what should we expect to see here in the upcoming weeks? And uh, let, let's start with, let's go back to Brad and then go back to Jay and then to Theo. I think the biggest pieces that we'll see in terms of their matches is UCLA is very deep on the pin, you know, especially with Ido David and Grant Sloan playing right side for them. Uh, and what we saw a little bit was sprinkling in some of the dub sub six two. Um, you know, before Ido David was healthy. So that's going to be limited. Their backup setter now will be Ayrton Garcia, um, who's a really good setter, uh, undersized setter, um, has probably some of the best charisma and personality in, in uh, all of NCAA and, and some of the best hair as well. But that's going to limit some of the opportunities and options that UCLA will be able to play with or, or tinker with in order to get some matchups or um, to kind of, get some guys on the court and get some guys some experience um, to see if they'd be able to help the team, you know, in a set, if someone's struggling. Um, so I think that's going to be what we'll see. And then obviously from the training perspective, losing one of the best players in the country is going to hurt your gym um, and decrease the level of intensity and competitiveness in their gym um, from the day-to-day -day grind with the team. Yeah. All right. Jay Hosick of George Mason. And, Ayrton took his hair from Fairfax and brought it to Western. I'm just saying, just want to remind everyone. 
Yeah, uh, I think uh, I think Brad nailed on the head. Your training in your gym is going to drop a little bit. I, I love Ayrton. Fantastic human being. Absolutely the best hair in the game right now. Uh, <laughs> and is a fan favorite. I mean, he, he's it's one of those guys that's just naturally charismatic, and and he's a, he's one of the best mus- young musicians I've seen, uh, and and has a real bright future and whatever he wants to do. Unfortunately, he's six foot uh, and doesn't touch 11 six like Rowan does. And when he gets into a situation where, you know, if God forbid that Rowan gets injured, that would that would really kind of suck because then you only have one guy in the gym and then you all of a sudden got to look at your coaching staff and see you can set up suit up and set and practice. But that's that's going to be a challenging situation as UCLA uh, will play very high level teams that run very fast offenses. And if Ayrton can't keep up with that uh, from the blocking perspective, it's going to be a big challenge for whoever UCLA faces. But until that point, Rowan will have the job uh, and Ayrton will run the B side and, you know, they'll, he'll, he'll do a nice job of, of getting that team, you know, some sets, but I think it's going to be a blocking liability that'll hurt more than anything. And that's going to be the challenge that UCLA faces moving forward from my perspective. All right, Theo Edwards of Cal State Northridge, close it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the you know, obviously the obvious part is the training, right? You lose an All-American, for sure, your roster depth changes. Um, but I think it remains to be seen whether this is a is an absolute positive for them. Uh, it reminds me of the story of the uh, Chinese farmer. There's a fantastic slogan that goes along with something like this. But you, the reality is you just don't know whether this is great or whether this is detrimental until it all plays out. And uh, this may be a moment for Rowan to step in and carry this team further than, than Miles was able to in the past. And, um, you know, sometimes these opportunities are exactly how you figure this out, right? And realize who Rowan truly is. Or there could be a moment where they really need Miles and, uh, and Rowan's struggling and they get down the stretch and they need that sub and they don't have it. Um, but I think it's going to be one of those things that no matter what, Volley Talk's going to be analyzing. They're going to go, oh, man, <laughs> if they only had Miles here. Um, I think that'll be that'll be the fun part. That'll be the interesting part to evaluate it and, and see how things turn out. Yeah. I always wonder, is there someone that was thinking of redshirting that could step in? You know, I, I'm not that familiar with what's not on the official lineup that's on the website, but no. Okay. Getting the uh, the shakes at there. There. There's a good inside info. Hey, all you guys listen, you're missing out. You should guys see Theo. He's not talking, but he's shaking his head. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let's let's move into a related topic. UCLA again, two of the biggest matches in the nation. I'm sure that a lot of people are watching. It was number two, Long Beach State against number three, four, no, three, UCLA, four, UCLA last weekend. Uh Obviously, it was a home and home series, but what did you guys observe from that series? Let's start with Jay on this one. Well, I think I think the two numbers that stick out to me in the first night is Spencer Olivier hit negative 143 and God Bold hit zero. Those are two big producers for your team on the first night that didn't get done. Now, granted, Olivier didn't play a ton, uh, but he definitely wasn't getting it done. Uh, and then the second night, they hit much better. Uh, but I think at that point, UCLA just kind of figured some things out and, and just played at a real clean clip. Um, but you know, the, the reality is it's two good teams. Uh, it's midway through the year. So much somewhat here and there, so maybe it's going to get better as the year goes on, but I thought you saw a UCLA team that was, uh, was, was pretty solid across the board and made some pretty good swings here and there when they needed them most. And that's really the difference maker between the best teams and the okay teams is the ability to execute at a high level for long strings of time. And UCLA obviously has some guys that can do that. Uh, Champlin is one of the best outside hitters in the country and, you know, he's got a bright future should he go pro. Uh, and that's a pretty good person to have on your bench. And you got a couple other guys here and there that are stepping up and there's your answer. <laughs> nice. How about you? We'll go to Theo. Yeah. I think the thing that stood out for me was Ito David. Um, I think the, the, the first night he had 17 kills hit 696. Um, I mean, that kid is just an absolute monster. And 
you know, I don't know that the stats always reflect it for him, but what he does at the end line is incredibly impressive and puts teams under a ton of pressure. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, any given night could Long Beach beat this UCLA team. I think so. Um, but to watch them, obviously, and, you know, I saw a video from one of those nights, this, the pyramid was absolutely sold out. I mean, what an environment for men's volleyball, which is really, really cool. But to watch UCLA be so poised and uh, have Rowan play the way that he did was absolutely impressive. So UCLA is still the force that we all thought they would be um, even, you know, even after losing to Penn state. So. All right. And Brad. Yeah. I mean, to me, it showed UCLA is just a little bit better than Long Beach right now, um, which is scary given the recent change at center and, and where they're at. And, you know, and you even saw it, Ido David was lights out night one and then night two, Ido David, not so lights out. Um, I think he ended up getting negative or had like five kills, five errors, somewhere around that range. Um, you know, and the ability for one of the better players to have an off night and still be able to come out victorious is um, speaks volumes to that team and that growth that they've had uh, from last year to where they're at now. And then from Long Beach, the thing that stood out to me is Siapinas is really, really good. And he was impressive from the service line. He was impressive in serve reception and uh yeah he definitely stood out watching that game as as one of the best players in the country yeah it's checking out the stats and ito davida night one 696 with only one hitting error with 17 kills and then oh you know what he doesn't need to play at night two because who steps in ethan champlin 12 kills two digs solo block three blocks this alex knight 11 kills yeah, they're getting great contribution from all around the pins. But again, repeat performance for Sotiris Stepanis of Long Beach State, who led the way both nights for the beach. And gosh, that, he is such a, like, just a star player on the court. You know, he he gets to everything. He's one of those things that has that, that sixth, seventh, eighth instinct to find stuff and make things happen. So exciting player to watch. Um, let's go to our next topic. And uh I got to see them firsthand, but man, I feel like the Cougars are on the prowl because they are taking down some teams here. They had Santa Barbara twice at the Smithfield house, but consecutive wins against the Gauchos. I thought for sure it would have been one of those, you know, BYU takes night one, Rick makes the adjustment for night two and it's a split series, but it didn't happen that way. So uh, let's start with, uh, let's go with you, Jay. Well, a couple of things stand out for me. Uh, UC Santa Barbara is not the UC Santa Barbara of the last few years. They're, they're rebuilding a little bit this year. Um, I thought the addition of Reese Barnett, uh, on the right side for Santa Barbara is a welcome, uh, additional weapon. The challenge is this is the first two matches he's played this season. So there's some things to be expected. He's going to maybe not be so crisp on, however, if you watch that match, that kid is legit got an arm and can bring it not only from the front row, but from the back row and from the service line. He's really, really good. Uh, and I know Rick was really uh, just kind of chomping at the bit a little bit, waiting for him to get in the lineup again. He got a, an injury that he had to take care of. I think the other thing, though, for me is that BYU's got a couple of pieces that are doing some nice things. First of all, uh, Mixer Man. Ennis is just annihilating the ball whenever he gets a chance. Uh, and the setter, Heath Hughes, is doing a nice job dishing out the rock, uh, who was at Grand Canyon for a number of years and transferred up to BYU. Those two are proving themselves to be a nice little duo that, you know, on any given night can light some people up if they're not careful. But, um, you know, I, I think I think it's I think it's safe to say that this is not as good as BYU will be or Santa Barbara will be. But I think BYU is better than Santa Barbara. And I think if they played 10 times, I think BYU wins probably eight of them. Uh, and this was just two of those eight on this weekend. That's my call. Yep. Let's jump over to Theo. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think one of the one of the biggest surprises of the year so far has been Santa Barbara. Um, and obviously not from a positive note. They're uh, they're two and nine as it stands. And um, I think that all of us expected them to be a little bit better at this point in time. Now, that being said, they've lost some matches to some really good teams. And, uh, you know, this is not like they're out here playing a cupcake schedule and, 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 uh, and losing matches. They're playing some really tough teams. And, 
obviously BYU was, was, was a little bit better. And, you know, I watched, I watched part of the first match and, uh, BYU was doing some really good stuff from a blocking perspective. And, and I felt like they touched and slowed down their hitters nicely. Reese was fantastic. I think he had 19 kills. And um, like Jay said, it was really nice to see him back in the lineup because I think that they're better with him there, but they got some things to work on. And I think the setter misses the mark quite frequently and, you know, puts them in situations that are a little bit difficult, but I still think that at some point this team has the experience and they have the poise and, and, uh, and dedication that at the end of this year, you're not going to want to see them. You're not going to want to face them. They're definitely full of weapons and incredibly capable of winning some volleyball games. So it'd be interesting to see how things turn around for them back after the season. Yeah. I just want to add that when I did the big West preview show and broke down all the schedules, Santa Barbara easily had the toughest schedule, but they were all on the road. All their road, their matches were on the road against tough teams, which other teams couldn't boast that in the conference. Like, wow, Rick is going to develop. And I'm telling you, if you get to the Big West, when you get back to the Big West tournament and you see Santa Barbara on the other side of the bracket, like, woo. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what I was thinking, Rob. It's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. All right, let's go to Brad. Yeah, on Theo's point, I don't think, you know, you tie it back to football, you know, I think a lot of people were bashing on the Minnesota Vikings this year and how good their record was and like being the worst, what they were like 11 and one team. But on the inverse, Santa Barbara might be the best two and nine team uh, we might ever see. Like, I don't want to play that two and nine team at all. I don't want to see them. We're going to see them in a few weeks. And um, yeah, that record's not going to come up at all. And they're not going to care and they're not going to have any any sympathy. And um, and it's just a testament to that schedule being battle tested, they're going to be growing from all those losses and learning from all those losses. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, uh, I don't even look at that record when I, when I look at UC Santa Barbara, um, it actually looks like Wilcox is coming along a little bit better. He's kind of starting to come alive, getting some more balls, um, from the Santa Barbara side. And then for BYU, um, the freshman Trent Mosier is playing really, really well, um, which has really stood out. Um, he's been able to handle and serve receive, um, he's obviously always been big and physical and good from the service line, good as an attacker. Um, so that's been some impressive performances. And seeing Sean Olmstead be able to manage their two right sides has been really impressive. Between Capono Brown, Anthony Sherfan, and being able to get them both playing time and mix and match. And, and he's obviously been finding the magic um, between the kind of the rotation there, which is really impressive job of kind of knowing your guys, knowing your team, and knowing what you need to win in that matchup. Yep. Good stuff. Here's the uh, the favorite topic of the day so far. Matador magic. Is there new magic in the Valley after the 3-0 East Coast trip for head coach Theo Edwards? Let's, we'll save Theo for last. And since Jay is out on the East Coast, we'll start with him first. Yeah, I watched both those matches. Um, I think Theo, first of all, it's not like Theo doesn't know anything about Princeton or NJ. Uh, <laughs> You know, he obviously scouted them and, and knows that they're good programs, but I think he learned firsthand that all the things that we've all been talking about, you know, they, they, they both got some pieces that can bring it from any part of the court. Uh, and Theo had his hands full. Uh, and there were some times that those other teams were serving for the match. Uh, and Theo's team buckled down and just kept staying steady and kept siding out and kept doing what they had to do. And then they ended up with a couple wins. And I think, the thing, the thing that I want people to understand that watch this is the top four or five teams can all beat each other. The next 10 to 15 to 20 teams can all beat each other. And, you know, Northridge is probably going to be in the top 15 this week. I had them, I think, at number 14 or 15. Princeton and NJIT are right there. Um, you know, and as you can see, teams of, of my caliber are still beating teams like Lewis, who was ranked at one point. So it just shows that on any given night, any of those teams can beat anybody as well. Uh, the depth of men's volleyball, with the exception of the top four or five teams, is really good. Uh, and it's exciting to watch because every week we're, we're, we're all constantly surprised about a match that went in a direction we didn't expect it to, because in history – we would have said, oh, that's that's a match that should easily be won. It shouldn't even be an issue. And now you look at it and you go, wow, that was that was quite impressive. But I think 
I think Theo learned uh, firsthand, or at least his team learned firsthand, that they can go five and they could come out the other side and feel good about their performance. And maybe they weren't as crisp as they wanted to be, but they figured out enough ways to, to, to get it done and win. And that's a good road trip for Theo. His team's going to gain a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge out of this weekend. Yep. Jump over the Brad. Yeah. I mean, every time I watch uh, Matador's play, I just think, man, hope is really good. He's really stinking good. <laughs> and the move and him to the right side and, and getting him a few more balls has really helped them. And, Wow. I, I was watching that fifth set and it was, you know, it's one of those matches where you're getting nervous when you're watching. You're like, oh, is there going to be a timeout? Who's going to be calling the timeout? Oh, is that a bad call or not a bad call? It's tough to tell on some of the broadcasts there. And um, yeah, dude, they just showed a lot of poise and a lot of calm steadiness through some of those. And it was, it was really fun to watch and see them battle. And obviously NGIT, you know, we've talked about them quite a bit that they have some really physical guys that, that can play some really good volleyball. Um, so from our perspective, it's no surprise that it's a five-set battle there. It's a five-set battle with Princeton. Um, it's kind of to be expected, um, but it's cool to see the West Coast team come out on top and battle through it. <laughs> We're going to have a CVW Classic, though, between UC San Diego and Cal State Northridge here. I think it's in the next two weeks, I believe. February 24th. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have a, the coach of the streaking matadors, not in the old school movie kind of way, but in the winning way, Theo Edwards on. Yeah, my, my administration continues to uh, send me messages calling our team the cardiac kids, which I think is is quite <laughs> hysterical. Um, but yeah, I mean, this this obviously this week was, was nice for us to pull out some wins. Um, and I think Jay hit it on the head. We learned a lot. Uh, and these were the first road matches for us. <clears throat> you know, we played in, we played a neutral match at, you know, at Santa Barbara, we played a couple of those and, but we've been at home ever since. And for this team, which is incredibly inexperienced in a lot of ways, um, getting on the road and having to fight is obviously part of the season and part of what you got to do if you want to be great. And, uh, I thought our guys showed some incredible resilience. Uh, we did not play that great. And if you watch the matches, uh, it's obvious we didn't play that great. Uh, but when we needed to, we played good enough to win. And and I thought that that was pretty impressive. And from a coaching perspective, probably one of the more difficult things to try and teach, uh, try and teach guys to do is to to kind of hang on and take a deep breath and relax and, and do what we've been training in the gym, you know, and find a way. Um, I think that when you get back from a trip like that, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that go through your head. And, you know, my hope is to, for us to refocus and and get ourselves back to a place where we can play some clean volleyball all the way through. And, you know, after, uh, after a trip like that, I, our team is exhausted. I, you know, if you guys remember the week before we went five with Stanford as well. And so it was three in a row, five setters and, you know, it was nice to find a way to win, but we we uh, we are definitely paying our trainers overtime at this current moment in time. <laughs> We're pretty awesome. bad. numbers. I forgot it's a four zero winning streak for you. Yeah, I didn't. I was just looking at the week itself. I'm sure. Uh, you know, with <laughs> is it Princeton night one, then NGIT, then after you. I thought you know maybe Jay was thinking, well, shoot, maybe maybe Theo's coming after me in Virginia. He's uh, <laughs> taking an EIVA beatdown tour. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I I, uh, I think I talked to Jeff about coming out here, but um, you know it just didn't work out that way, and so it is what it is. You know we'll we'll get back on the Matador schedule in years to come, I'm sure. Uh, but you know the reality is it was a good trip for Theo, and um, you know it's always fun to see uh, conferences that historically are are you know one one is always historically stronger than the other, but then they come out and they recognize well that doesn't mean anything because this these teams are good. You know, and, and people, people I know love to bash the EIVA for whatever reason, but the reality is the EIVA is not a bad conference. Uh, we're just, you know, unfortunately we've had one horse for a long time that's been the leading, the leading team, but these other teams right behind them are not bad. Uh, yeah. they'll, put, they'll put a hurt on you if you're not careful. Ben Harrington is no joke. <laughs> he is no joke. He has put up numbers. He hits literally, literally, legitimately in the seventies on his serve on some serves. It's well, it, and he did it like seven times in a row, which was <laughs> just almost unfathomable. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yep. Hey, uh, Theo, I happen to see. I don't know if it was on your personal feed or Carl France's personal feed at FDU that match, but was there some kind of celebration of Black History Month? I saw a, 
a picture yeah, of so, you and a plaque or something? Yeah, Carl and I uh, are both on a podcast um, that that essentially talks about black history in men's volleyball. Um, and we took a picture with the T-shirt. Uh, and yeah, that's that's essentially what that was. It wasn't a flag. It was a T-shirt. But uh, yeah, me and Carl have, have quite a history, man. We've uh, we've done a lot of things. And I think when the pandemic started, uh, Larry Rather, uh, Nikki, uh, and all of us jumped on a podcast just to talk about the Black experience uh, in men's volleyball. And Larry made up a bunch of shirts, and that was just one of them. So we took a picture kind of to celebrate it. Now, did he create a muscle one for you particularly? <laughs> <laughs> Not, not quite. <laughs> yeah, it was actually, it was mesh. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I don't mind if you uh, drop the name of the podcast. I'd love to get it out yeah, there. It's, it's called Motivate. It's called Motivate uh, Volleyball. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. If you go check it out, it's on all of the, the streaming services. And essentially, we've, we've talked to tons of the black athletes that have played in men's volleyball and obviously it's hosted by all of the black college all the black coaches in division one and division two that's awesome that's uh i, I knew there's something special there i couldn't read the uh, text my eye my glasses were off so <laughs> <laughs> well let's keep on going our, our top items of the week and you know, it's been a while since we've seen them but warriors awaken up at stanford for two you guys get to catch the match and look at the boxes on that we'll start with uh let's go with uh brad on this one yeah i thought um i mean mucleus keeps standing out more and more the more i watch him play and i think last year he had some off nights um occasionally not not very frequently you know one every six matches he was you know hitting below 200 where he's been pretty steady and pretty dynamic and you know watching a little bit of those matches checking in and out with them seems like he's getting a lot of those junk balls as well and a lot of out of system set and a, and a lot of balls getting thrown up to the net. And he does such a good job of getting it from a high point um, and being able to go chisel off the block, hit with range around the block. Um, but Hawaii serving seemed to take a toll on Stanford over time. And I, I, looking at the aces, it's pretty comparable, but just seeing the Stanford passers slowly break down um, through the consistent pressure over both of those matches um, speaks volumes to why Hawaii is been where they've been the last two years uh being atop the last game yeah jay your take on the uh stanford hawaii series and yeah, this is the real deal right i mean the kid he's like six eight looks like he weighs about a buck 30 wet uh and needs to run around in the shower to get wet but the kid is legit and has got an arm that can get him out of trouble um you know i think for me uh, if I'm watching those matches in the future, like as the season wears on, is Mucleus built strong enough to last an entire season? Um, and then I think that will be the question mark. But yeah, that team is is stupid good. Uh, you got four foreign kids in that starting roster that are uh, really solid at their at their positions, and they're really good at, at playing the game at a high level for long periods of time. That's there should be no question marks there. And back to the Big West representative, Theo, on the Hawaii-Stanford matchups. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I think uh, this isn't a surprising thing, but, you know, every year Hawaii has a tough time scheduling, right? They're an island, they're far away, and it always is is a it kind of like a question mark. Like, hey, do they still have it as we watch the matches that they play across the early parts of the season? And then they come and they play a team like Stanford, who is a fantastic team with a fantastic coaching staff. And then they do this, right? And it's a reminder of how great this team really is. And I think the first night they hit 440 uh, as a wow. as, a, as for their <laughs> offense. And Jacob Thiel is just the is just might be one of the best setters we have seen in a long time. Um, and this is a testament to to what he's doing. And obviously, Demetrios is is impressive and back to both nights he was just ridiculous 12 kills the first 17 the second he hit like 517 on night two i mean it's just absolutely ridiculous um yeah no kidding jay's dusting <laughs> off the shoulders i mean it's it's that type of performance um but hawaii is a force there's there's a reason that they're uh in the ranks that they're in and they're they're the top team for sure at this point in time yeah and stanford you know, they had <clears throat> Ethan Hill had a great couple nights in the middle there, 
Will Rotman's one of the most fiery players in the conference, as you've you've seen the. Uh, <laughs> and then Teo Snowy, what a surprise out of Berkeley! That Oppo that that Costi got to play from because he is so strong and hits a heavy ball, and Hawaii came in and did that this weekend. You know, and you know, the chatter is Jakob Tella isn't one hundred percent. Mike, well, shoot, if he's not one hundred percent, that's gonna be scary when he's one hundred percent because he didn't look like he missed a step. So. <clears throat> Let's uh I'm only gonna add one more series because I worked them and saw it firsthand. But uh UCI faced Pepperdine in a home and home. Um Pepperdine was without Jacob Steele you know, due to injury. So uh they were down, but Jalen Jasper is a monster. And it, no matter you can only just kind of contain him, but he's gonna get his his kills and he hits a hard ball. Trey Cole, Libro for Pepperdine was doing some amazing things, but unfortunately it wasn't enough. My guys took it 2-0 this last week, but, you know, Halir Hanno went off from the service line, set a new program record for aces at eight in a match. And again, you know, you've got to look at Sonny. He's just having a great season so far. So that's all I will say on that. If you guys want to chip in, great. If not, we can move on to our next topic. <laughs> Heno on Heno serving, he probably has the most aggressive toss I've ever seen. That He's tossing it almost 15 feet into the court sometimes, uh, and it's impressive to watch it. And it's cool to see as someone who uh, believes in that helping a server, it, he, it definitely has helped him with his serving. It, it's cool to see. Yep. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Every time I look to see, <clears throat> even if I don't know the result of what Irvine did, I can pretty much just go to the stat sheet and see what Sandy did. And if Sonny has had the night that we know he's all we, he's capable of, like, for instance, hitting over 400 and, you know, having double digit kills. Yeah, I think that Irvine's going to be there. They're going to be in a position to win. And uh, he did it. He did it. He had 15 kills, hit 440. I mean, that guy is an absolute maniac and a, an absolute pleasure to watch him play volleyball. So I got a question for you, Rob, because you were there both nights. Yeah. All right. So obviously – uh jasper's legit he reminds me obviously of ben patch from back in the day in terms of how high he touches and his arm swing the question will be um will he be able to figure out blocking i think ben struggled a little bit with that later on in his career but jasper uh is pretty big but here's my question the second it was at the second night joe carlos left the match early or left shaking hands and ran outside was he injured? Was he not happy about being in his old gym and was was having some words with somebody? What was what was going on? Was he okay? Yeah, you know, actually, I saw him at the end of the second night because that's when we can jabber and talk about the night. You know, about his blocking performance because he did some get some solos, which I was really surprised. You know, six foot setter, and that's a you know very liberal six foot. We'll say. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure why he ran out. I may have been just to uh, catch someone on the way out. Maybe and one of the Pepperdine players was just not, you know, unhappy, but he just wanted to say goodbye because like, he's connected with all those guys still, you know, they, they left on good terms or he left on good terms. So my guess is probably just chasing someone down and cause he came back in, was in great spirits afterwards. You know, why not? You got the win and you know, he did get a couple solo blocks and that's one of the things I celebrate as a short setter back in my career. So <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah good couple nights there at Irvine and Pepperdine that's a team you definitely cannot sleep on once they're fully loaded John Winder first year coach he's gonna do some good things you just tell that he's he's getting into that culture and reprogramming not reprogramming but shaping guys thought processes because I think what's going to keep them from succeeding you know at the end of the season so <clears throat> And with that, we had conference kickoffs here, the NEC, Conference Carolinas, and obviously Jay had his one conference match as well. But uh, top of the NEC, Damon and uh, um, SFU or St. Francis University, Loretto, Conference Carolinas, King and Lees, McCray are both undefeated. In the MEVA, though, can't forget about Dan's conference, even though he's not here today, had a big opening night in the MEVA with an upset of Ball State in Muncie. And uh, Loyola and Ohio State are 2-0 and in the conference. So uh, thoughts on what's happening in the MEVA? We'll try our best with Dan not here. Let's see. Let's go. Uh, you know, let's start with you, Jay. <clears throat> well, I think I think you're learning that the MEVA is wide open. Uh, you know, everybody had anointed uh, Loyola and Ball State as being the top two teams. Uh, and then there was Ohio State and 
uh, and Lewis and a couple of others behind that were, um, you know, in the hunt, so to speak. And then you had a, a few programs down at the bottom. And what you're learning, Lindenwood better be taken legitimately. Otherwise, you're going to you're not going to feel so good. PFW has the ability to beat anybody. Lewis can beat anybody. Uh, and Loyola is not exactly, um, you know, uh, completely undefensible. They're 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 going to have some nights where maybe they aren't playing so clean. So to me, that's probably the most exciting conference to watch right now because anybody can beat anybody on any given night. So that's my take on the meet right now. Yep. Let's go over to Brad. I think Ohio State's in a really good position um, to kind of take and run with that conference. I think they have some good pins. Um, and then Ball State, seeing what happens, I don't think Janice has been playing much, so maybe recovering from an injury. Um, I haven't noticed them too much, but I also haven't been paying a ton of attention to those matches. Um, but yeah, I think it's wide open for those top four teams, and even McKendry's um, going to seem to upset someone every once a month. They have a big upset, and maybe not much of an upset anymore since they're just a good team. And I agree, Lindenwood has. I mean, I think it's uh, AJ Lewis and Schuler are. are two dynamic pin hitters that they can get hot and make it a, a tough night for anyone. Let's close it out with you. <clears throat> yeah. You know, the Mivas, it's just another exciting year, right? I think uh, Jay kind of hit it on the head and saying that anybody can beat anybody. And Loyola comes out to the West coast and shows that they have some weaknesses, right? They lose the Concordia, but then they turn around and take Long Beach to five and show that they're right in it with the best of the best. Um, I think really when you when you look at these teams, it's about consistency, right, and finding the consistency. And we've talked about it. Those top four teams are a little bit different than the rest. And those guys have been have showed that they're consistent day in and day out, um, where the rest of the teams and, you know, our team included, we're all trying to find that consistency and find a way to uh, to play this game at a high level all the time. And uh, I think there's a ton of teams in this Miba group that are capable of, of beating, you know, top 10 teams and, and being right in the hunt. So it's pretty exciting to watch that conference compete. Yeah. Let's jump our next topics. I know we are running long, but only three undefeateds left in the nation. Charleston at 11 and 0, Grand Canyon at 11 and 0, and Hawaii at 9 and 0. Charleston opens up EIVA conference play. They host Harvard on the 17th and 18th. So we'll be watching that one. Grand Canyon, they take on USC this week, and then Hawaii – they host Concord, uh, sorry, branding CUI. So that's a place where Jay got his master's. So, but we're going to call it Concordia. We're going to ride Jay's, you know, his alumni status there. But, and we already talked about some of the athletes for the week, but I wanted to for sure get what you guys are watching in week seven. And let's start with you, Theo. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, there's so many good matches coming up. <laughs> like that was, it was probably one of the hardest things to talk about. Um, I think if I had to pick a few, Pepperdine, Stanford, I think that's going to be an excellent match. Um, you know, obviously they've got two really, really good opposites um, that are going to go head to head and, and to watch that is going to be exciting. For sure, for sure, GCU and USC is going to be another really, really good one. And then I think BYU and UCLA, right? BYU coming off the success of last week. And then UCLA having to refocus after having two of the probably the biggest wins of their season so far. So I think those would be the three that'll be pretty thrilling from my end. All right, let's jump over to Jay. Well, you had mentioned that we had a match last week uh, against NJIT, and we actually postponed that uh, due to some COVID health reasons. We wanted to protect ourselves and protect NJIT because they're going out to play Long Beach a couple times next week. So we're rescheduling that match later on in the year to go out to their place um i want to talk about charleston real quick before i move on to the scheduling charleston is 11 and 0 um and you can argue that their schedule has not exactly been the strongest yet uh and and you wouldn't be um you wouldn't be wrong it's not exactly like they've had a ton of teams that are highly ranked or uh highly sought after in terms of scheduling however They've won every single one of those matches in 3-0 fashion. Uh, so that's impressive. Uh, usually you hiccup here and there or a team figures some things out, but they're rolling right now. I'm really going to be watching Harvard and Charleston to see what Charleston's really made of uh, and, and what Harvard can bring to the table. Uh, I'm also going to be watching Princeton versus Penn State. Penn State this weekend rolled into St. Francis of Pennsylvania 
promptly went down 2-0 and then pulled out the reverse sweep and beat St. Francis in five. Uh, and I think the stat I saw was that there was 50 some odd hitting errors or, or unforced errors, including serves from wow. Penn State. That's an awful lot. Um, I don't know the reason why that happened, but uh, Fisher did not have a great night. They pulled him out and put Kerr in there. And I know Wildman's going through something right now. Uh, they just did not look that clean, but St. Francis took care of them. Uh, and that's a good match by them. I'm also going to be watching NGIT Long Beach. I'm going to see what uh, New Jersey can do. But the uh, the one that stands out to me uh, is Grand Canyon and USC. Grand Canyon is now going to face uh, a team that has a couple of pin blockers that are really good. Uh, and uh, they're not going to be, um, I, I think it's going to be one of those matches where there's going to be some really clean things going on and then some not so clean things. And the team that can suck it up the most and, and eliminate the most errors um i think it's going to be the team that wins and i and i like grand canyon's chances in those matches yeah all right jump over to brad what are you watching week seven <clears throat> yeah these guys hit a lot of them and i think the the three undefeated teams playing um definitely are, are marquee matchups to watch you know hawaii concordia concordia is coming off a tough week uh riley's going to get those guys playing hard and battling um out on the island when they go out there to play. So that'll be a fun one to watch, see them compete. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd assume one night um, Concordia makes it really tough on Hawaii, um, whether it's in a couple sets or, or um, sneaking in a couple victories, but um, I wouldn't be surprised to see Concordia be real riled up um, from one of those matches. And then I think Grand Canyon USC is kind of the premier matchup as these guys talked about and seeing Grand Canyon, they're, they're really good. And if they can sustain this and continue sustaining it, you know, now they're looking on potentially moving up into the three or four mark um, based on how this weekend goes, which is cool for them. And I think I think Charleston gets it done. Um, I know we're not really doing predictions too often, but uh, I, I think it's fun to see. And, and I, I'd love to see Charleston kind of pop up and, and take over and, and kind of really start getting in some of these rankings after um, where I think they're exactly where they should be right now. But if they get a couple wins against Harvard, I think they could sneak into maybe 15 or or somewhere around that mark. And then I think Loyola's got two good matches, Ohio State and Ball State um, with Loyola are probably the, the two marquee matchups in the MIVA from my perspective. Yeah, good calls. And we'll close out with you. <clears throat> oh, I went first. Oh, Ready my up, bad. Oh, all good. <laughs> all good. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> who's left? I thought I, I hit, I didn't hit everyone on that one yet. <laughs> I guess, uh, well, you know what? That's right. I think as a uh, go, I'm watching King versus George Mason because I did see that release. I was like, you got COVID in your camp, Jay. I hope everyone's okay. And, you know, I, I, I mean, you, you have a light schedule this week because I think that's the only match that showed up. I thought you said at first we had a light schedule and I was going to look at you and go, really, this is a light schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. We have one match this week uh, with versus King and, uh, and yeah, we're, we're figuring some things out. So. <laughs> we'll leave it at that huh well hey uh again thank you guys for all the time you've committed here this morning and for checking out the matches during the week good luck to your programs again follow them on social media go to their websites hashtag ncaa mvb and uh you know it's with great gratitude brad ross stratter of uc san diego jay hosick george mason and theo edwards of cal state northridge and of course dan fran who's doing important things right now of Lewis. And he happens to be off for the week. I noticed, oh no, he's got a Lindenwood and, Lewis, uh, Lindenwood and Quincy. So good luck to him as well. Uh, gentlemen, have a great rest of your day and thank you again. Thanks for listening to College Volleyball Weekly. Be sure to follow Rob Espero at the Rob on the Mic on Instagram and at Rob on the Mic on Twitter.